hello English Lit students. This is a revision uh, PowerPoint on some of the key contexts for Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Historical and social, okay, not, not genre contexts. So, I'm um, going to go back a bit in history to explain what the context of Kansas is and what that state stands for in the American imagination, and particularly for someone like Truman Capote, who is not from that area at all. Um, so, the Midwest and the Far West in America is associated with the idea of the pioneers, okay? Um, and there are some really important ideological ideas around pioneers in American culture. Uh, and one of the key key phrases um, that explains the pioneers is an argument called manifest destiny. OK, uh, this this was coined in the 19th century and it's an argument by which the white European settlers justified taking land in the West of America from non-white and non-Protestants. So, yes, Native Americans, also Mexicans. OK, so the Mexicans were seen as equally unfit or lesser than the white Protestant American settlers. And it's a really chop logic argument. It's a, it's a working backwards argument whereby, oh, we were so successful in taking all this land from these people. It must have been God's wish for us to do it. So that's what a manifest destiny is. It's clearly our destiny. It's that's what manifest means, that it's clear. Um, and therefore, that was kind of used to justify, which in every other way, legal, ethical, moral, <laughs> was hard to justify. Um, there's also this famous phrase, go west, young man. You may or may not have heard the phrase go west, uh, addressed to young men. Uh, and this was aimed at the poor and insecurely uh, employed of the American Eastern Seaboard. So when immigrants, poor emigrants from Europe arrived, they tended to arrive on the eastern seaboard, New York in particular. Um, and the cities in New York were a bit unhappy with all these poor people. And so they gave them this jolly advice, keep going, go west uh, and settle out there. OK, so this was once again a myth. Oh, you'll love it. You know, it's free, loads of land. Go and have a great time. Uh, this was also encouraged by a uh, uh, series of what were called homestead acts and the pioneers are sometimes also called homesteaders a homestead is like a house but also some land around it uh, and in 1862 uh, u.s settlers were u.s citizens sorry were offered 163 acres um, to settle and farm um, and by 1900, 80 million acres of land that had previously not belonged to anybody slash was already in use by the Native Americans who lived there had been settled. Settling meant farming, putting up fences and obviously coming into conflict with people who used to live on that land. This appealed, this, this vision of uh, Manifest Destiny and Go West and the Homestead Act all appealed to those looking for a new start. Um, immigrants were, some of them were impoverished, landless farmers from Germany and Scandinavia, as well as Eastern Yankees. Uh, and if you look at some of the names and some of the histories of people who settle in the Midwest, you'll see lots of German and Scandinavian um, heritage. It's a simple dream. This is the myth again, a simple dream of property ownership, personal personal autonomy um, and an escape from European class bound societies. Uh, so these people are coming from um, countries where they had been the lowest very often of the low. Um, and this dream is that they can have their farm, have their land, be free and rule themselves. So that covers how can Kansas was settled. Okay, which is the setting, the main setting of and certainly the most important symbolically in the novel. Um, so Kansas is the geographical centre of America and it's on the American Great Plains. You may have heard the word prairies, these enormous wide open spaces, large grasslands. It was opened to settlers and the arrival of settlers was boosted by, as I explained on the other slide, the Homestead Act. It's, a, it's still a rural state, it always was a, a 
very rural state, so very different to New York. Remember, that's where Tru Truman Capote is based, that's where his readers are based, that's the newspaper magazine he's writing for, a New York-based audience and newspaper. So different to the rural state of Kansas, the largest producer of wheat in the US, and hopefully remember that's, what, that's what's made Herb Clutter rich. Um, and in the picture there, that's one of the grain um, silos, these enormous, what the Capote calls, says they're like Greek temples, white, rising from the plains. Uh, they have Protestant ethics, which is their religious, but also sort of a cultural way of being, uh, being very conformist, um, simple, thrifty lifestyles, a denial of luxuries and pleasure, a common sense approach to life. Something that would be helpful for revision would be to think about how that applies to Herb Clutter and other people in Kansas that we meet. Kansas was the first state to prohibit alcoholic beverages. This is long before prohibition became a national law in America. That was in 1881. These states are sometimes called dry states. Um, and that's certainly the case when the book is set. That wasn't repealed until 1948, sorry. Uh, but even then, public bars were prohibited and that restriction was not lifted until 1987. So you might remember the lady who runs a post office uh, used to run a saloon. OK, now, once again, this is not when the novel is set, but this is another thing that Kansas is very famous for. And it has a, such an enormous impact on American society, the depression, the Great Depression, that it, it still echoes into the lives of the characters we look at. Um, the Great Depression of the 1930s, that's an economic crash. OK, so it's a, when we say depression, it's an economic term, meaning really low economic activity, massive unemployment, massive poverty, um, no industrial work going on or very little. So there was a Great Depression in the 1930s. It was ushered in by um, the Wall Street crash of 1929. So that's when there was massive speculation. Shares and stock prices rose enormously, created what it's called an economic bubble. The bubble burst. Everybody lost all their wealth. Stockbrokers threw themselves out of windows. That's what happened. Um, banks failed. And so normal, everyday people whose money was in the bank lost all their money. The bank just failed. The bank, the money had gone. Stock prices plummeted. The economy contracted and wages fell 45 percent. Can you imagine that? Unemployment rose to 25 percent, a quarter of the population unemployed. People who couldn't afford their rent or their mortgages were just made homeless. There were shanty towns and people living in tents all over America. In Kansas, this, there was also an agricultural um, depression because drought and over farming in the Midwest had created a dust bowl and the topsoil just blew away. Um, so if you've read um, in Mice and Men at school, that's set in this period. Farmers often just abandoned their land and joined other destitute people living in shanties in cities or drifting. So this idea of being a drifter, drifting from place to place looking for work. And this is specifically referred to in the text because during the Depression, Herb Clutter worked for the Federal Farm um, Relief Board, which was established to aid farmers. Um, it also applies to Perry because Perry's father, this is when Perry's father gets really drunk, there's no, gets really drunk, gets really destitute, there's no people going to fairs anymore. Oops, sorry. Okay, the novel happens, the events in the novel happen at the end of the 50s. Okay, so the, the book is actually published in the early 60s, but the context in a way that matters, certainly for what happens in the book, is the 50s the height of US post-war optimism. America has just become a world power. <laughs> At the expense of us, you'll be happy to know. Uh, the Second World War is basically the end of Britain as a world power. Bankrupt the country, end of the empire, budding, that's the end of Britain. America, on the other hand, has risen and become a world power at this point. It's the leading manufacturing nation. The gross domestic product is growing. It's one way of measuring wealth. There's, there's a big demand for high skilled employment, lots of car manufacturing, things like that. And there's also a baby boom, which just more people often creates more money because people are buying and spending. 
There's economic prosperity for many, and amazingly, for a country like America, high levels of social welfare. Um, compared to what they have today, very, very different. You know, proper social welfare in all bunches of places. Um, and between 1953 and 1960, you've got this real settled power with the president being Dwight Eisenhower. He was a successful war leader, he was a Republican, uh, but he was quite statist compared to Republican leaders today. But everything felt really calm. So I'm um, I've talked about this so many times, the American dream in the 1950s. Um, the dream is the promise that every citizen has the cha same chance of success. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're born, who your parents are. It's just hard work and ability and you will rise to the top. OK, that is that is the, that is the basic level of the American dream. George Washington had chopped wood and became the president. So could you. Um, by the 1950s, this success is measured largely, but not solely, in terms of ownership and consumerism. House, car, television, etc. Another feature of an American dream success is social success. And, and it, you can see now how the American dream is a male, it's a masculine dream, it's aimed at men, because part of the dream is having a wife. <laughs> Clearly doesn't apply to women, therefore. Uh, having a wife having a family, but also being popular and fitting in. It's really important to the American dream. Um, and there's a quote here by Robert Reich. He was the Secretary of State for Labour. The faith that anyone could move from rags to riches with enough guts and gumption, hard work and nose to the grindstone was once at the core of the American dream. So it's interesting to think about how far that is endorsed by what happens in In Cold Blood or criticised and challenged by what happens in, in cold blood. Need to mention racism, partly because of some of the language in the text. Uh, racist attitudes, overt and covert, are in evidence in America throughout the 1950s. Uh, the most oppressed groups in America included African Americans and Native Americans. Capote has his uneducated anti-heroes use racist epithets including the n-word and he's doing that as a mark of class that i don't think it's just he's saying oh aren't they nasty because they're racist there's something low status about using that language because it's so crude um native americans were not all nomadic but they were mostly clearly they were displaced by the settlers moving american settlers moving they were warred on they were deceived in false treaties and they were decimated by um, european illnesses and alcohol, which is a real problem for Native Americans. Um, remember that Perry's mother is, uh, I think he says Cherokee. OK, and there's some interesting racial um, ideas in the novel whereby Capote often talks about him having Irish blood and Native American blood. And Capote does seem to believe in some racist ideas of how being Irish makes you behave, how being a Native American makes you behave, being violent, being drunk, things like that. They are in the text. Um, there was institutionalised racism against African-Americans in, in these periods, uh, especially in the former slave states, that's the southern states, uh, starting to be challenged in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, the federal government had to pass laws in the end to desegregate the South. Um, but, you know, you're probably thinking about this. This is not a novel that touches on that a great deal, uh, but I do think we need to know it. Um, teenagers, uh, mostly in Holcombe, we, we, it, we, we introduced and we meet two or three teenagers, and this was a big phenomenon in the 1950s. The concept was relatively new. The term teenager had only been coined in the 1940s. Um, and it did start in America, the idea of being a teenager. Um, and they were enjoying the economic boom. There were products marketed at them, including films, music and fashion. Um, car ownership gave young people a certain level of autonomy um, and in the novel um, we know that Bobby Rupp um, is taking um, 
uh, to, on a date to the cinema uh, to go and see films. In fact, I think maybe Blue Denim is the film that's, that's mentioned. I'm sure that's the reason I looked it up. Um, so we're just getting some touches of that, that teenage culture um, and, the girl, and the young people in Holcomb and what their lives are like. Now, mentioning homosexuality because of Truman Capote himself, but also there are some people who read um, homosexual feelings either between Perry and Dick, just Perry. Some people have felt that the reason Capote is so sympathetic to Perry is because he also liked Perry, was attracted to Perry. So um, it's, it's just worth knowing what that was and what that meant. Um, so prior to 1962, anti-sodomy laws existed across America, which effectively criminalised gay sexual relationships. Uh, but homosexuality, male homosexuality, was also pathologised, that is made into an illness, uh, by um, American psychiatrists who, described, who called homosex male homosexuality so a sociopathic personality disturbance. Um, Films and television often coded villains and criminals as homosexual. They wouldn't use that term, but there'd be something about the way the character dressed, spoke, looked. If, it was a ho if you could guess, if it was implied they were a homosexual character, very often they were a villain or they were weak or they were comic. Um, there were code words that hinted at homosexuality. Once again, the, that word itself wasn't used, but words, insults such as sissy, Nancy, queer, pansy, etc. Those were around on television, in film, um, and everyone knew what it was they meant. Openly visible gay men were either actual or fictional, effeminate and artistic types. And what's kind of interesting about Capote is he was. <laughs> he was, he never hid that he was gay. Never, never in the closet, as they used to say. Uh, he was very small. He had a very high and feminine voice. So he was in some ways, he did fit the caricature that existed in America, but he was very interesting in never hiding it. Even when he went to Kansas, he called everyone darling, <laughs> things like that. Um, despite all this institutional laws and bad social attitudes, homosexual acts took place between men, uh, men who didn't necessarily think of themselves as gay. Um, so there was often homosexual acts between men in male only spaces, such as prisons and the armed forces. And if you think about Perry in particular, uh, we learn about how he has been sexually harassed slash sexually attacked uh, in the Navy. Um, and it's never said in prison, but there's that sense, you know, the, the, his relationship with Willie J, for example, seems to be um, a, 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 a one of romance slash attraction. Um, heteronormative masculinity was seen as the cure for homosexuality. So sports, being outdoorsy, that was meant to, you know, help a boy not be that way. As usual, nobody cares about the lesbians. <laughs> Just not a worry, we're not going to talk about that. 